this morning. Joining us from Europe, which is 6 a.m. at the moment. So thank you for your time and effort, uh, Dr. Robert Sparrow and his co-authors. Um, that uh, I'm hoping that I'm going to read the name correctly, but Mar uh, Margarita de, um, sorry, hang on, de Fries Mekeva and Matias Trieger. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Robert Sparrow will be presenting the paper um, and he is affiliated with the International Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University Rotterdam and also affiliated with Wageningen University. We are also fortunate to uh, have Dr. Sirojuddin Arif this morning. He is a senior researcher at the Smell Research Institute one of the uh, leading think tanks in Indonesia. And Dr. Sirojuddin uh, Arif is the lead author, uh, the lead researcher on the report on strategic review of food security and nutrition in Indonesia for Smeru. And also uh, that is working with uh, WFP and I think the NP2, Pak Sirojuddin. So Dr. Sirojuddin will be the discussion later. So uh, without further ado, I think we can start on our seminar this morning. Uh, Robert, you have about 30 to 40 minutes, to, so maybe around 30 to 35 so that we have a, lo a lot of time for Q&A. And Dr. Sirai Jujin, you have, uh, we'll later follow with about 10 minutes of discussion. Silakan, Robert. Uh, thank you very much, Lydia. I, I hope my slides are now visible. Yes. On yes. Screen. Great. Um, well, thanks for inviting us, first of all. It's really uh, these times of no international travel. It's great that we can at least uh, get in touch with you uh, digitally um, and, and uh, share our results with you. So I'm glad to, uh, uh, to be participating in this FKP seminar. Uh, and as you already mentioned, um, I'm, I'm presenting a paper, but I have several co-authors, uh, some of which who are here. So let me also briefly introduce them first is Margarita. Um, who is here, um, who is at the ISS as well. Um, Martias is also at the ISS, he's also here, and they can help me out with all the tricky questions at the end, they promised. Um, and now we have two co-authors from Indonesia, Erfi and Rina, who are uh, with the University of Indonesia. Um, and I understand they could not be here uh, today, um, um, although I hope perhaps they might hop in at some point. Um, but these are my four co-authors, and and uh, um, um, and so well, I present the paper on their behalf. And um, um, so let me have a technical issue here. Slide moving. Okay, I think I've got it. No, my slide moving. There it is. Yeah. Yes. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have a paper, um, and it's called "Snack Snudges and Asymmetric Peer Influence." Um, and essentially what we do in our paper, we do a, a food choice experiment um, with children in Indonesia. Um, and what I'll do, I'll first give you the background of the, of the food choice experiment and the motivation for doing this experiment. Um, I'll look into the objectives, uh, study design, and we'll go to the results, some of the mechanisms and policy conclusions. Um, now, before we go to the experiment, just let me set a context for you and um, um, also the motivation for our study. So this, this paper is part of a larger research agenda we have on, on the nutrition transition in Indonesia. Um, also looking at obesity and, and dietary uh, changes in dietary patterns. And um, um, this is one of the first papers. Um, and the main motivation is the double burden of malnutrition in Indonesia. Uh, something I'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, but there, there's quite now a substantial literature um, on this double burden of malnutrition in Indonesia, especially looking at stunting, right? That's something that had a, a, has had a strong policy focus in, in the, over the last years um, and at the moment. And I'm not sure if this is really the latest number, um, but the last numbers that I've seen on stunting is that it's currently just around 30%, right? It's, it's been quite... Uh, um, disappointingly stable for so, a long time and recently has, it has been dropping again. Um, but what we also now see is, is the other part of the double burden is this increase in overweight um, and not just with adults but also with young children. So 
the latest figures that I was able to find um, for children under five was about 12% of them being overweight or obese, right? So that's more than, than one in 10. Uh, and that has increased quite strongly in the last, over the last decade or so. And so on the one hand, we see still this very persistent um, under, uh, undernutrition or poverty-related undernutrition in, in the form of stunting children um, that are, so stunting, for those that are not familiar with the term, that's when children are, are uh, too short for their, for their age, um, uh, which is an indicator of, of long-term uh, nutritional deficiency and which we typically associate with poverty um, related malnutrition um, and overweight, of course, and refers to the, the, the weight for age. Um, now, there is this term, the nutrition transition. It has been uh, raised by or defined by, by Popkin already some decades ago. Uh, but it's, it's a, a, a transformation or a transition that we see in many countries, um, high income countries, but now also increasingly middle income countries, low income countries. Um, and it relates to a, a, a change in uh, dietary patterns that are, is related to economic development, uh, globalization, uh, uh, changes in lifestyles. Um, and we now see this also kicking in in Indonesia, as we've seen also in many other Middle income countries. So this is not uh, just an Indonesian uh, story. We see this all around the world. Um, and Indonesia as a lower middle income country, um, I guess that's still the right classification. Um, we will see quite relatively high economic growth compared, for example, high-income countries. Um, we see a growing middle class uh, over the last decades. Uh, we see increasing integration in the global economy. We see, uh, of course, um, very big changes in, in media in the last, uh, also with social media and internet over the last years, last decades. Uh, and that has led to changes in people's lifestyle and diets. Um, and um, what we see in particular, and I'll show you a nice graph in a minute, but we see that the, 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 the consumption of what we call uh, calorie-dense foods, uh, fats and sugars, uh, typically in processed foods, has increased strongly. Um, and But that grains, the rice, uh, but also fruits and vegetables, and to some extent also more protein-related uh, foods like, like meat and fish have, uh, have decreased. Right? So we see this change in, in dietary patterns really more towards processed foods and more towards these dense calorie type foods. Uh, with high sugar contents, uh, high fat contents, um, and that with with that comes also increased risk of, of non-communicable disease, think about heart disease, uh, um, uh, diabetes, etc., and also for children, so not just for adults. But it gives you just a very quick idea of um, of this nutrition transition, and I should also add a sort of this picture does not give us the complete. Um, and all the dimensions of the nutrition transition. This is a very rough picture. This is data from BPS, um, which I believe is taken. They, they calculated from the SUSANA, so we did not uh, calculate the numbers ourselves. These are from the BPS website. Um, but these are just some here. We see some shares. I don't know. Can we can see my pointer? Can you see my pointer? I hope so. Um, so here we just see yes. um, income shares, expenditure shares. So. Like I said, this is not a complete picture, right? It doesn't really give us calorie intake or uh, um, sugar intake or uh, share in the total uh, calorie intake per food type. It's just ex food expenditure shares, right? So the amount of money people spend on certain types of food. Um, and this is the type of information typically collected in, in the surveys, in Susana surveys or other surveys. Uh, and here we see the expenditure shares here on the vertical axis. Right, you see the, the, the share the 0 to 18, uh, uh, so this will be 18% of the budget. And here we see the years. And this is, let's say, the last two decades. And one, well, a couple of patterns are striking, uh, two in particular. Uh, one is this, this strong increase of processed foods. Now, this is a, a combined term, right? It may, it may include the very different type of foods, but uh, prepare the processed foods. Um, um, tend to be more uh, calorie-dense uh, type foods, um, and that has increased strongly, right? So below 10% uh, in the, 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 the last end of the uh, uh, 20th century, and now we're, we're above 16% and rising, right? It just doesn't seem like it's, it's flattening off, it's still rising strongly. Uh, quite a strong surge in the last five years, in fact. Um, and then we see this decrease here in grains, so this would include, include rice, for example, but also other, other, other cereals. 
um, decreasing very rapidly already in the, let's say, two decades ago, but it's now slowly not decreasing as fast anymore, but it's still clearly decreasing. And we see some small or, or more subtle changes in fruits, vegetables, and uh, fish and eats, right? but still we see a decrease there. So this is just one, idea, one reflection of this new nutrition transition that I was mentioning. Uh, and that is a part of uh, the obesity also with young children. Let me turn my pointer off. I might need it later, but turn it off for now. Um, now, what we want to look at in this paper is that we are not looking so much at evaluating a policy to deal with the nutrition transition, but more the step before that. We want to understand some of the, the mechanisms uh, or the behavioral mechanisms that could uh, help us inform uh, defining policy responses. Uh, and what we look at in particular is the information and behavioral nudges. Um, now, first of all, we look at information that, that has traditionally of course, being a, a key element of healthcare interve interventions, uh, I think with information campaigns, providing information uh, on, on healthy nutrition, made right? through so education or media uh, or uh, um, yeah, media uh, coverage uh, messages um, on healthy lifestyles uh, and with information. Um, um, this is, of course, has been a key element to many health interventions, but we we get very mixed signals of how effective it is and how, how effective information can be to, to help people help, uh, change people's behavior. Right? So there are some studies that say, I've listed a few references here, some studies that, that say that it can be useful, but there are also a number of studies that, that get the um, ambiguous effects. Right? It's, not, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, and of course, it, it, it depends on the, con the content of the messages and how the message is delivered. But we, we don't get a very clear, uh, clear positive effect of information. Clearly, we need to do something else to change people's behavior. Uh, now, a recent, well, recent is too strong a word, but, but a phenomenon that we have seen come up over the last decades or so is the use of nudges, right? Small, uh, uh, giving people little incentives uh, to change their behavior. Um, this has become quite popular now also, of course, in economics. Um, and, and these have been widely used also to influence dietary choices. And um, they're appealing to policymakers, right? They're, they're low cost, uh, they, they're, they're intuitive. Um, so, it, and then they can be very uh, effective for targeting children, right? We, with, with little small signals, uh, try to, to, to get um, children or to essentially target your spontaneous decision the spontaneous decision making. Right? It is not providing information, these little interventions <coughs> to uh, trigger spontaneous choices. Uh, um, and um, well, that, that can be quite effective then, of course, also for children. Um, but of course, they do not operate uh, by themselves uh, in a vacuum, as we say here on the slide. There's a context within which these nudges need to, will operate. Uh, and for example, they will operate within a social context and um, um, so, of course, the children is exposed to other signals, for example, their peers, uh, who also make uh, uh, nutrition choices and then can influence the children. So, we want to look at these factors in our, in our experiment. On the one hand, look at nutrition, uh, sorry, information on nutrition. On the other hand, look at nudges um, um, to trigger spontaneous decisions by children, but also within the social environment um, of the children. And they're looking at the, the peers' choice and how that influences these, um, these children's decisions. Um, now, what we uh, contribute with the paper, what we hope to contribute, is that we will look at how, how can these cognitive nudges, and we'll give you a clear example of the cognitive nudge that we use in our paper or in our study, how can they help us influence or trigger uh, children's uh, decision making in the choice of uh, getting a, picking a healthy or unhealthy snack, in our case. Um, and we look at how peer behavior, so the choices of their, their um, affect their decision, and that essentially um, what kind of spillover effects they, they generate. And finally, we'll, we'll try to see whether these um, uh, nudges, or cognitive nudges, and whether, or peer behavior, whether that has different effects depending on the type of information we give children. So we have different types of, or levels of information provision, and we'll try to see whether these two um, 
affects uh, these two, two factors. So cognitive nudges and peer behavior have uh, different influences given the information that has been given. Uh, to, to put it into actual concrete action, what do we do? We, we, we look at uh, nudges, so we look at effective and social nudges uh, um, for primary school children um, in Jakarta. Uh, we look at their snacking behavior. Um, uh, we, we provide we provide information. So we, we, we look at, we, we provide information through a video um, and we see how that uh, affects their decision making, but also then the operation of these uh, these emoji labels and the peer behavior, um, and well, we hope that this kind of this type of the, the results that we have can help inform policy makers um, for the, the defining policies to target the, or interventions to target the children. So it's very important to just emphasize here uh, what we do is a behavioral experiment. And so we try to look at the the mechanisms that drive decisions of children. We don't look at actual. We don't evaluate interventions. So, but the information or the results that we uh, show can help inform uh, developing policies that, of course, can then be evaluated, um, and um, right, we can we can inform policies on what what uh, how, to what, what extent can we uh, can we target can we effectively target individual behavior, individual decision making, um, or to what extent do we need to take a more, for example, a, a paternalistic approach. Um, and uh, um, affect, for example, a food environment rather than to target individual behavior. So that's the aim of our study, to inform those kind of policy decisions. Um, and to, it's, just to emphasize, it's not, really, it's not, a, not, not a policy evaluation, but it's a behavioral study to inform policy uh, decisions. Okay, so this is, we have a study design, obviously. Um, and um, what we did, it was in late 2019 already. It seems much shorter ago, but uh, time flies. Um, and um, um, we did a Babel experiment in central Jakarta. So all very close to Smeru, I believe. Uh, most of the schools, some of them, I think, are walking distance from Smeru. Um, and we went to 18 schools. And um, this is Margarita led this, uh, this field work. And... Um, um, Margarita and her team went to 18 schools and there involved over 1,600, almost 1,700 children between the age of 6 to 13. So we're looking at grades 2 to 5 uh, in, their, in, their, in the experiment. And the experiment centered around a food choice, a snack choice of children. And what we offered to children was either a banana or that's a healthy snack or an unhealthy snack, a choco pie in this case, a choco pie is the, the label, you might know it, it's, it's a common uh, chocolate uh, cake type, type of snack. Um, now, I won't go into the reasons for the, or no, I won't go into the details of choosing these two um, snacks, uh, but we have studied um, uh, the, the, the snacks beforehand, but we, we needed two snacks that are comparable, for example, in the type of price, the availability, uh, um, the size, I said, they need to be comparable snacks. We, we tested a few other things. I think we worked with Oreos, right, Margarita? Uh, we looked at other types of fruits. Um, we did a little, small pilot test beforehand. Um, but this was the, these are the type of snacks that are reasonably comparable, of course, except for the, the calorie content and, and the sugar uh, uh, content. Um, but it's also, these were also two snacks where in the pilot we got a fairly even response without any, 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 uh, Interventions. I think we got something like a uh, just under a 60-40 split. I can't remember the exact numbers. Um, so based on the pilot, we decided to take these two two snacks. They're also easy to to manage to handle, um, and they were uh, well, we think these two very comparable substitutes, right? So the only substitute, the difference between these two snacks should be it's healthy or it's unhealthy, but both should be tasty, uh, and children should know them, right? They should really be able to identify. Okay, the banana is a healthy snack. It's a fruit. Choco pie, oh, we know the snack. It's, it's a chocolatey snack. It's nice. It's uh, the same size of a banana, but it's unhealthy. Children should be aware of this. We should not be able, we should not have to inform them beforehand why this could be healthy or not unhealthy. Um, and then, given that choice, so we face children with this choice, um, we then randomly expose children to some treatments or nudges. So we have one group, uh, children were allocated randomly into four groups. Um, one group 
the control group and they were not exposed to any treatment. They just had a choice of a snack and they could choose whatever they, they wanted, a banana or a chocolate pie, and then, um, and then eat it. Uh, essentially, that's what it came down to. They could eat their snack uh, uh, after they choose it. And then we had a group that we exposed to this uh, effective nudge uh, and um, to the emoji. Uh, so we had a little smiley face. I'll show you a picture later on. And that's the type of nudge that, that would appeal to the effective part of our affective part of our decision making rather than the deliberative part of the decision making. So looking more at spontaneous decisions rather than uh, a deliberative part of decision making or uh, I think that's what part is the right term. Uh, but with deliberative uh, um, uh, factors or, or the deliberative part of the decision-making system uh, that relies more on the information that we have, right? the knowledge that we have in making rational decisions. Um, but that might be when you check out the, uh, we look at the, 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 um, the nutrient or the calorie content when you're in the, in the supermarket. There you may rely on, or to some extent, on your, your deliberative the deliberative uh, part of the decision-making decision system, but there's also a more spontaneous part, right? The way you, you, you have the impulse to buy something that looks appealing uh, or that you think might be uh, might be tasty, and you you, you, you use more of the, the impulsive part of your decision-making system um, uh, in that choice of food, um, and that's where the, what the, the smiley face appeals to. But I'll show you, give an example uh, in a minute. And then we have the, uh, uh, the peer effect. So we have a positive and a negative peer. And again, I'll show you a picture in a minute, but what we did, we were also randomly, so when children made the choice, just before they made the choice, and they would be, they would be entering, uh, making the choice one after the other, right? So they, they would, wouldn't queue up, but we would one by one bring them into the, the test room. Uh, and for the, the children in the positive or negative peer group, they would see a classmate leave the room with one of the two snacks. So they would be under the impression that one of the classmates had just chosen a banana, which is group three, the positive peer, or they would have chosen a choco pie, which is group four. And I'll, I will show you in a minute how we did that. Um, but, though, but in those groups, they would then be uh, faced with, uh, um, uh, uh, well, we can call it a social match, right? So that uh, um, that's a nudge that would refer to uh, the social norms or the expectations that children would have on what is a healthy snack. Uh, and then by seeing a peer uh, choosing one of the two, that would then alter the, the cost of deviating from that social expectation, um, either in a positive or negative way. And we use, so this, is, this was the, the most complex part of the experiment because we needed classmates. Uh, we, call them, we, we call them confederates in this case. Um, I'll, I'll explain the whole randomization process in a minute, but what it comes down to is that before we randomize children into the, uh, the four groups, we selected two children with the assistance of the teachers to, uh, to help us, to be our special helpers, as we, we would call them. Um, they would not be part of the experiment, but they would be helping us be the positive or negative peer. And we would also have boys and girls uh, uh, to which to the children would be exposed. Um, and they would help us then uh, um, um, yeah, influence, be, be the negative or positive peer, um, and then thereby uh, potentially influencing the classmates. But I'll give you a picture of that in a minute as well. And then fourth, we block on prior education information. And with blocking, uh, I mean that really in the experimental sense, that we have divide, we divided the sample in two groups, randomly divided into two groups, and then within each group, we, we randomly provide the, um, uh, the nudges, right? the cognitive and the uh, affective nudges, or do we provide the, the, the cognitive nudges um, and social nudges. Um, and so we have one group that we expose to a video um, and we created a video uh, which the children saw before they would make the, cho the, before they make the choice. Uh, and we had one group another randomly selected half of the group that was not exposed to the video. Right? So, and that's, those are blocks, right? So within those blocks of, of, of having, being exposed to the video or not being exposed to the video, within those blocks, we would then randomize these four treatments. So within the blocks, we also uh, 
than are statistically powered, so based on power calculations, we chose a sample size that within those blocks, we are powered to identify the effects of all those uh, three interventions relative to the control group. Okay, so let us let me say something about the experimental procedure, and hopefully a few things will be clearer based on a few things that I just uh, mentioned. Um, um, so here's an example of the classroom uh, uh, where children are being uh, gathered. So we work with the schools. Uh, the schools will help us then uh, select the class. And um, and I should also, I think I forgot to say, these were schools that um, uh, we, we, we selected randomly from the list of primary schools in central Jakarta. Um, and that, of course, were willing to work with us. Uh, and um, so we worked with, with with the schools to help select the class. Um, and then within the class, we would brief them on the experiment. Um, all the parents had already been sent uh, a letter or an email. I can't remember whether it was a letter or an email, but Margarita might will inform us later. But um, they were asked to, to sign a consent form uh, for the children. And so we, for those children that, that then had signed, for which parents had signed the consent form, um, those children would then be uh, involved in the experiment. Those that were not involved, and again, I have to look at Margarita. If I'm saying this correctly, she can correct incorrectly. She can correct me later on. Those that were not that did not sign the consent form, they would not be part of the experiment, but they would join the rest of the class. In the, uh, I think they could get a, um, oh, they could not get a snack, right? Because they were not did not sign the consent form for providing. And I'm looking at, I see Margarita on the screen. So as long as she's nodding, I'm, I'm I'll continue. Otherwise, I'll. Uh, but um, if they did not sign a consent form, they could not. They would not get a snack. Um, is that right, Margarita? Uh, yeah, they would not get a snack and they would not participate. But I think they would be in a group. Uh, no, I don't know. Did they get their little present afterwards? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but the point here is that, of course, children in the, in the experiment, um, their parents had all signed consent forms. Um, and there were two stages in the randomization. One, one of the stages happened before we entered the school. Um, so we already had, of course, the sequence of how children, how we would conduct the experiment. So we would randomly select groups of children into video or non-video exposure. And within those groups, we would then expo randomly select them into the different treatments. Um, so the, those sequences we could randomize for the school beforehand. Uh, so we knew how many children uh, would be in the school and how they would then enter into the whole procedure. But in the school itself, we would then need to randomize children into that into that process. Right? So we need to randomize children into the uh, into the different groups and then getting them into the right order for the treatment. So that's what we see a picture here with little keychain labels. Children would then select a number from the bag, um, and that would then determine in what kind of group they would end up, uh, a video or no video group, and then what kind of treatment they would be exposed to. And we had some in-class activities to keep them uh, to keep them busy because this was this took a few hours for a whole class to go through. Um, so here we have some some examples of children um, um, drawing, and keeping them busy. So we we have anonymized some of these pic uh, these pictures where you see the children. Um, um, okay, and then here we have a picture of the uh, after the children have been randomized into different groups, we then expose them to the video. So here we have one example of a school. So this is, here you see a little table we set up outside the classroom. Uh, and typically we would have two areas where we, or we had several areas where we would work in the school. Uh, one is, of course, where we provide the instructions. Then there's a test location where children would take, choose a snack. And then we would have a place where they would go afterwards with the snack, where they can eat their snack. Um, and where they would do a small survey. So we had children fill in a small survey. We had a very nice... I don't have a picture of it here, but we had a nice survey with some pictures, and we asked them some questions on the, what what did you choose, why did you choose it, uh, what do you think uh, about fruit or vegetable, um, what would your mother, or your parents, or your teacher or will expect you to choose, etc. And that would then be after the choice. It's also the place where they could eat their snack, and where we then also uh, I have a picture of that later where we then measure their height and weight. So, but here they this is in between uh, just prior to choosing the snack. Um, and we would expose them to a video. We made a small video, uh, and uh, and it was an adapted video, I think, from my plate, uh, which is a campaign. And uh, is that correct, Martin? Margarita, that I have 
food dude and my it's my plate right my plate was the the, the format for the video and then we adjusted it with the indonesian um, uh, actors um, and of course in, it was presented in indonesian so the children would would, would get some information about uh, nutrition um, and here we see four children and those are the, and these four so they would be randomly uh, allocated into this this case the education group if they would not, if they would be allocated into the non-education group, there would not be the video. There would be you could see it there next to the, the laptop. There are some toys, right? They would have they could they could play a game uh, while they wait for their snack uh, to get their snack. Um, so that would be for the non non-treatment non educate non-video groups. Um, and for the video groups, that would be in the, in the same location, but they would see the video instead. Now we have groups of four children, so we have the four treatment conditions. So we have the control group, the the smiley faces and the peer, negative peer and positive peer. Um, so children would be sort of the video would be randomized across groups. So those are our blocks. But then within the blocks, so within each group of four, we would then randomize the nudge across the children. So one of these children would get the smiley faces, one would get only uh, the choice of the snack, and the other two would get a positive or negative peer. And so that's how we um, operationalized the experiment. Then we get to the expand experimental procedure. So right after this, so one by one, these four children would then be asked to come to a room and to take a uh, to choose a snack. So here we have our one of our supervisors in the team, uh, and then she would one by one uh, bring the children into the room and they could choose a snack. Presented here on a tray, and there we see the chocolate pie and the banana there in the background, and the child and going up there and just making a choice, selecting the snack and going out of the room. To the larger room where they could and eat the snack and do the survey, um, and they had four choices. So, I'm um, looking just at this this picture on the right. Uh, we see a girl walking towards the table, and I think she is exposed here, or she might be exposed to this um, first treatment control, because we just see a plain tray there in the background. And here on the picture number one, we see that more zoomed in, and there we see the choco pie clearly and the, and the banana. And this was the choice they they, they could make. Um, they could select one. We would not explain anything about this during the uh, experiment that uh, we just asked to select or choose one of the uh, but later they would not get any instructions in the room except for go ahead and choose whatever snack you want um, and then we had a second tray where there were emojis and these emojis also were shown in the video so in the, in the educational video so they were also uh, shown in the video um, and this would then be the the yeah the nudge that would that could trigger uh, spontaneous uh, actions of children or have spontaneous influence on the decision. There's no information provided, of course. It's just a smiley face, a happy face with a banana, and an unhappy face with a choco pie. And then we had two, um, I hope this is visible for uh, the audience, we had a positive and a negative pair. So the positive pair would be exposed to the plain tray as in picture one, or also the girl in the top screen. So that could also be a positive or negative pair. So they had not a smiley face. But here we see, and I'm going to get my pointer out again. Where's my pointer? Here it is. So here we see a child entering the room, right? So we see a boy here entering the room. And as he enters the room, he sees that the door is opened by our supervisor. Um, and as this boy enters the room, he sees another boy, a classmate. This is one of our confederates our special helpers, uh, they would leave the room and they would hold a snack. And I think this boy, I can't see correctly, this is a banana, right? He's holding a banana. And they were instructed to hold it like this or in a way that the child entering the room could see it. So this boy entering the room clearly sees, look, my classmate, he just chose a banana. There would also be, of course, a negative peer. And we see two girls. Now we alternated this, of course, for boys and girls. It isn't that only boys would choose a banana and a girl. The, the, the girl peers would have a choco pie, so we also randomized that, uh, the gender, uh, across the, 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 the different effects. In this case, we have girls with the, with a choco pie, so she's clearly holding it here in her hand, and her classmate, as she enters the room, sees, um, look, my classmate, someone I know, um, has just chosen a choco pie. So that would be uh, the, the negative peer effect. And this would then randomized, as I said before, for those with and without, and just a, an education video prior to the uh, uh, to the choice. But yeah, I don't know how I'm doing for time. I don't have a clock in front of me, so just let me know if you um, want me to speed up. Uh, 
Robert, you have about yeah. four minutes. For, okay, I will speed up very quickly. Four to five minutes, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, and then after the experiment, uh, we, uh, um, um, the, or after the choice, they could go to the quiz room uh, where they could eat their snack, do a small survey, and we would measure their height and their weight to get their anthropometrics. Um, here's just a sample. I won't go through this. I don't have time for this, but it's just a, some descriptive statistics. Um, and um, um, what, what I can, you can have a look at the paper and see that, that those descriptives are all nicely balanced uh, across the, uh, the different treatment states. So I've been talking too much in the beginning, so I need to rush a little bit through the results, but I'll try not to rush too much. Um, the main results are in this slide and the next slide. And here you see the results from uh, for the group without the video. Right? So there's about 800 children, roughly, of sample allocated to these uh, different treatments. So for each treatment, we were at roughly just over 200 children um, in the information block. Sorry, this is a non-information block, right? The group without the video. And we saw that for the control group, right? This, these are the children that were not exposed to any treatment, not to the video, not to any, not to any of the, uh, the nudges. We see that more than 60% or 63% of the children chose banana, which is actually a little bit surprising. It was higher than what we expected uh, based on the pilot. Um, but uh, so substantial, more than half of the children chose a banana. Um, but then those that were exposed to an emoji, uh, they would, to the cognitive nudge, um, then it would increase by more than 10 percentage points. So we see a 30 percentage points increase. So more than three quarters of the group would then choose a banana. Um, and then those exposed with a positive pair slightly more would choose the banana, but not it's not statistically significant. So we have these bars here, which indicates the confidence interval. And of course, this effect is clearly outside the confidence interval, uh, right? The 67% of the control group, and vice versa. But for the positive pair, this difference is not statistically significant. But then for the negative pair, we see an image, a large drop in the choice of the banana, right? So two thirds of the children chose the choco pie. Uh, after being exposed to a negative peer, seeing a classmate leave without the uh, um, uh, see a classmate leave with a shock of pie, uh, two thirds would then choose a shock of pie themselves. Now, if we look at the group with the video, right, we see this. So I'm just going to switch this up and down. So here we have 63% chose banana in the control group with no 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 exposure to any treatment at all. Then just providing the video increases by about 21%, going from 63 to 84% choosing the banana. So the, the video in our case clearly had, a, had an effect. Um, and for the other, other incentive, we see a very similar pattern. Uh, we see that the, uh, the emojis work, they increase it by about 10%, a little bit less than for the control group, for the, for the no video group. Um, there's no statistically significant effect for the positive pair, and there's a large and also statistically significant effect for the negative pair. So we see the same pattern for the different educator, for the different information blocks. And just to put it into here, we these are results from a regression, but we also look at the results from simple t-test. Um, but, but just to, to put some numbers to those impacts that we see and some statistics, some significant levels, uh, here we have the no video block, uh, the video block, and then we have also some interactions. We see that the emojis clearly increase by the 13 to almost 9% for the two different blocks. Uh, we see the positive pair has no statistically significant impact and the negative pair has a strong negative statistically significant impact, clearly the strongest impact. And the video itself raises the uptake of a banana or the healthy snack by about just over 20%. We see no interaction effects. We don't see, there are some differences uh, in these uh, impacts for the different blocks, but we don't, they're not statistically significant, they're small. So we don't really see that the information boosts some of the nudges. So they really operate separately from each other. Um, then briefly go to some, we looked at some of the mechanisms behind uh, um, the choices and we asked children, um, so why did you choose that choice? Why did you choose your banana? And they would say, well, it's a healthy snack or I like the, the taste of the snack, it's a tasty snack. Um, and we looked at their responses as well, but we also looked at their opinion of fruit. So this is not the reason for the choice, but what do you think of fruit? Is it healthy? Is it tasty? Is it a good snack? Um, I think we even asked them about whether it was expensive, but we don't think there were many responses to that. So here we have the uh, um, 
um, the responses to that. So, so these questions would refer to the child's knowledge, right? the, the priors before going into the room uh, and make a choice. But these really refer to the choice itself. And we see that um, for the information block, um, so this is the percentage of children that, that, that uh, would say, well, I chose a snack because it's healthy or I chose a snack before because it's tasty. And we see that um, for those that, that were exposed to the video, relatively more children would refer to the choice as a, the, the, the reason for the choice as being a healthy choice. Um, but what's interesting is that for the other, for the, for the, the nudges, um, we don't see any differences except for the negative peer, right? So we looked at statistical significant differences between these different effects. And the only real statistically significant difference that we find are the effects of the negative peer compared to the control, but in this case also the others. Uh, for both the video and the non-video group. Um, we don't find any statistical significant effect here for the priors. I think we only find it in two cases where there's a difference between the peer, the negative peer, and the emoji. I think it's for this group uh, between these two numbers and these two numbers. But um, generally speaking, we find that the emojis, or the, the sorry, the, uh, the nudges have an effect of the choice, but it does not affect the prior. So it really suggest that this is really a, a nudge that, that affects spontaneous decision-making, not their knowledge uh, or their opinion of the, of the snack. Um, and we also looked briefly at, um, we'll look at this briefly now, at the, uh, the, 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 the um, expectations. So we asked children, what would your teacher choose for you? Or what would your mother pick for you? Or what would your friend pick for you? And they would say, well, most of them said, of course, my teacher mother would choose the banana, 80%, 83%. Um, and we do see that conditioning on the choice, where the children chose the banana or, or the chocolate pie, um, those expectations are a bit higher. So we do see that those priors, those expectations of parents or teachers play a role. Um, but then if we look at the, the deviation from those expectations, we also looked at whether, so here we, these are results from a, from a, from a binary regression. Um, I think it's a probit or a logit, I can't remember. Um, but we look at the effect of... Um, or maybe just a linear regression. But we look at the effect of those nudges on deviation. So that we have a zero one outcome if a child's choice would deviate from the teacher's expectations or mother expectation. And again, we see that the emojis and the positive fear do not really uh, provide, they, they don't affect the, uh, the, the, the deviation from the parents or the mother uh, for the teacher's uh, uh, choice. Um, but only the negative pair a peer effect is, is, is sufficient or, or is substantial enough to really influence a child to some, such an extent that they will deviate from the expectation of their, uh, their parent or their, their, their teacher. Both okay. with and Sorry, Robert. Yeah. yeah. It, I'll get to the conclusion. Okay. Uh, but good. Uh, Thanks. We're almost done. <laughs> uh, so what do we find? Uh, nudges are effective in uh, altering choice, snack choices. We see a positive effect of the, uh, the emoji label, we see a negative effect of a social nudge, of the, 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 the negative uh, peer's choice, unhealthy peer's choice. And we do see that these peer effects really are much larger than the, uh, the labels, right, the emojis, and we don't see any positive peer effects. Um, we do see information having an effect in our case, quite a large effect, actually. It's, it's a, a substantial effect. Um, but we don't see any interactions with these, uh, uh, with, with the emojis, uh, with, the, with the nudges. Um, um, and we also do see that the negative peer effect is still larger than the positive effect of the video. So this, my final slide, I just want to then highlight what can we learn from this for policy, right? So why, why is this, uh, um, that is not an, we're not testing policy, we're testing behavioral responses uh, um, to elements that could be part of a policy. Um, so within this context of a nutrition transition, uh, what we see is that cognitive nudges, um, they can help influence children's decisions, but they are relatively small to the social context, right? To the, to the adverse peer effects. Um, so, um, what we, so what we also find, on the one hand, we find that, I'm just going to the last point first, the, the positive peer effect having no influence, that, that is actually quite, I would be worried about this if I was a policymaker, because it means that um, those positive messages that you might try to bring across with role models, right, or, or ambassadors, uh, giving positive information to children, you know, eat a healthy snack, 
eat an apple that's good for you, that, that doesn't seem to affect us very much, have a big effect, at least not in our table experiment. What does have, an, have a strong effect is the social environment. So if we see people, uh, so for example, the food, food uh, uh, supply, food availability, seeing peers eating unhealthy food, uh, seems to have a much larger effect than uh, those, those uh, nudges or, or interventions that, that just target the individual's decision-making um, or those, those individual interventions. Uh, so this would suggest that, that, that rather than to influence um, uh, children individually with, with information or with nudges, that th this might provide some uh, motivation or support to more paternalistic uh, interventions. Right? Think about limiting the food, uh, the food or adjusting the food environment in schools or, or, or in the neighborhood of schools. Um, and think about the street vendors that are outside of schools um, rather than to than to, to rely on, on the individual's decision after giving them information or not just uh, maybe this does uh, uh, give support to more pat a paternalistic approach. And I know that that is, I know that everyone agrees, of course, on, on those, those are political decisions at some point, right? We have to decide to what extent do we let people make this choice themselves or do we need to, to, to influence or restrict the availability of uh, unhealthy food? Uh, near schools, um, but uh, well, we hope that this kind of information can influence uh, policymakers um, in those choices. Okay, um, Lydia, I'll leave it at this. I, I think we have a discussion. I don't want to take too much of his time, uh, but uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Robert. Maskero uh, Judin, I think uh, time is yours. Go ahead uh, to provide your discussion about 10 minutes, Mas. Uh, maybe you can stop the share screen, Robert, so that yeah, uh, Masiro Judin can hear. Yeah. Um, where do I do that? Oh, there at the top. Sorry, but two screens, stop share, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you to Lydia, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this discussion. And let me also express my thanks and congratulations to Robert, uh, Margarita, and uh, Matthias, as well as other co-authors who have made this uh, very powerful uh, article with powerful message from the policymakers, especially for uh, uh, food and nutrition. So uh, a couple of points that if I highlight from uh, the, the paper is that one is that uh, uh, the, there is a negative peer effect which have consequential impact on how uh, children select food. That's one thing. And the secondly is, even though the uh, uh, the information might work to improve the the, the choice of children, but uh, it might not work to mitigate the negative uh, peer impact. But uh, I might not go into detail into the uh, details of the experiment and or how the, the result come up. But let me uh, probably link with uh, other research that we at SMER have done. So, so as a background of information, uh, as Bolivia also mentioned that we at SMER have uh, produced uh, uh, what we call strategic review on food and security in Indonesia, which deals also with the, with some point with children. So probably let me use this opportunity to, to link uh, several pieces that probably we have left unexplored in our, our, our review. But uh, what Robert provided us today is very, uh, very helpful to answer the question that, that uh, we didn't uh, deal much in that report. So before that, let me bring some uh, other background information about the, the food situation in countries like Indonesia. So at some point, it is true that uh, uh, countries like Indonesia is undergoing uh, nutrition transition to add more fat, more sugar, etc. But it is important to note that uh, a child, uh, lack of fruit and vegetable consumption is common across the world, not only in developed nations, but also uh, in developing countries. Or first of not only in developing countries, but also in developed nations. So if I may uh, uh, state some information in the US, for example, 60% of children did not consume enough fruit to meet the recommended daily intakes, according to which, uh, WHO is it's five portions per day of uh, fruit and vegetables. And uh, the same situation is also found in Europe. 
in Southeast Asia, 76.3% uh, of adolescents between 13 to 15 years old also uh, did not have adequate uh, food consumption as suggested by WHO. So it's common across the world. So it might indicate uh, the common pattern of uh, transition, but probably there are some nuances across countries, especially if you look at countries like uh, Indonesia. So uh, in this country, fruit and vegetable consumption also low by international standard. So this is the result of the latest risk assessment. Nationally, on, only around uh, five percent, less than five percent of the population age five or older, who, who consume, uh, I think, uh, say more five percent or more, which is recommended by WHO, and only eighteen percent consume three to four percent or per day. So in Jakarta. Jakarta interestingly reflect the national situation. It doesn't deviate much from the, the, national, uh, uh, the national figure. So if we assume that uh, there is transition, we assume that Jakarta would deviate much from, from the, the national statistic, but it is not. Uh, so uh, probably it is true that some statistics show yes, the country has undergoing uh, uh, food transition, dietary transition, but probably not in vegetable or food product, but, but I don't know. But the case is Jakarta reflect uh, much the, the, the national uh, statistic. And, uh, and in similar countries, and if you look at the, the risk of this, the result of risk of this, it seems uh, the, the, the result is not systematically that the more, the more you go to the cities, the less people uh, 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 eat vegetable and consumption, but so it's quite uh, not that way. So, as a result of this, Indonesia is ranked very low in terms of food diversity. So this is the result of the Global Food Security Index in 2019. Indonesia is ranked 102nd out of 130. So the country uh, clearly has a problem with the, the food diversity. So sometime when reading the, uh, the paper, I thought, what does actually in the figure that the Jakarta school children show uh, tell about the, the, the country's case? And I'll talk about more later. So back to the, uh, to the paper, I think one of the big questions in the literature about uh, food and uh, nutrition among children is are nutrition knowledge and behavior related? So uh, I think the paper deals much about the, uh, the knowledge, but uh, probably the, the bigger question is are knowledge and behavior related? And so far, if I see, uh, uh, when we consult the literature, the result about uh, this question is inconclusive. So some people say that knowledge and behavior are not related. And to some point, actually, the papers also show that, that even though the people, uh, the children say banana is healthy, but they choose other, not, not banana. But others, others suggest that uh, from social cognitive theory, nutrition education works, yes. If you, if, you give, if you give uh, some information about healthy food to children, they will choose uh, healthy uh, food choices. They would, they would have diversity in, in their snacks. Uh, but others say, well, if you test that uh, in, in other situations, well, in countries like Ghana, for example, uh, nutrition education improves the knowledge, but not the behavior. Even though the, in terms of knowledge, yes, they, they indicate they will prefer a healthy food, but in terms of uh, food diversity, no, it doesn't have impact. So uh, uh, Robert's study, Robert and other study, uh, shows that yes, it has a mixed result. To some extent, the video, for example, the video have positive impacts, so the, the nuts have positive impacts. So if we relate this to, uh, to Indonesia, the question probably is that under what condition can nutrition work? Uh, this question, I think, is relevant for countries like Indonesia, in which uh, resources are limited to provide, say, behavioral programs for food, right? So in that case, information can be uh, more economical to provide. It, it doesn't cost uh, much. But the question is, under what situation uh, uh, see the, the uh, nutrition knowledge work to improve uh, food choices? So for example, the country has what, they, what we call as uh, national action plan for children's school snacks. So the way the program works is that this is run by uh, the National Agency for Food and Drug Control. 
And the core of the program is to provide technical assistance for food and school canteen and parents how to provide a good snack for children at school. But I don't know how it deals with uh, with say the other food uh, snack providers outside the school, but it's concentrated in the school and it's about the technical assistance, how to provide good snack. So the question is, if you look at the, the paper, it seems, well, probably it doesn't work uh, well to improve the, uh, the situation, but the program might, uh, all, the government already uh, allocate much budget in, in, that, uh, in that program. So the question then, how, how should the government improve such, such program then? Uh, secondly, I'm, uh, I also have some question about the, when you, 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 you talk about the, the mechanism. So when consulting with the literature on this aspect, some people say this is a review of articles. So uh, one review suggests that food availability and parental modeling effects at home have strongest effect on healthy and healthy food consumption. Probably uh, some papers will say not the strongest, but other papers say also that uh, food availability at home and parents do have a uh, significant impact on uh, children's choices. So if we link it with the uh, Indonesia situation that only few people actually have enough uh, uh, food, uh, fruit and vegetable consumption, it might uh, lead some people to ask, what, act what does the vegan Jakarta tell us actually, right? Because, uh, well, people might ask, oh, it's really good that actually 63% uh, to 80% of children choose banana, which is very different from the what the discuss does uh, actually show us. Discuss does uh, show on only three few people have uh, adequate uh, food consumption, and so that's that's. Uh, so the question is then: so how how does how do you take account uh, into your model actually in the parents? I I see that uh, to some extent you you include the. I think the mother's education or mother and parents work. So, uh, so the question is how how do parents affect children's snack food choices? Actually, if it is true that this variable have a strong impact, I think it, it's good to to have a look at that. Uh, I note that at some point your paper, you have a question. You said that you have surface to uh, parents, and then uh, from the question to the children, I think you also ask. Uh, the the eating habit at home, whether it is available and to, to how much actually fruit and vegetable uh, available. So I I assume that uh, you uh, this is usually for for researchers. Usually they have done several several things, but probably because some problem they haven't shown yet. So I, I wonder what what does act, uh, if if you look if you take into account the situation, what what does uh, what do the data tell us about uh, the situation? How how do how do the parent affect, and how how do how do the parents actually mitigate the negative impact of peers? So, uh, well, this can be a random, uh, uh, Robert. But but uh, sometimes I think like this: What if actually uh, the way the children think is that well, actually uh, the, the the lowest figure that uh, shown by that is shown by the negative peer. That actually the the actual the, the actual trend, but because they at school, because they at school, so they uh, they think oh I should I should choose the good choices. But when they see the, the their friends, probably the, the actual figure is between the the lowest and the the control probably just just this uh, is the imaginary situation or say hypothetical uh, 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 other hypothesis. So actually the actual figure is the is just the middle, right? And now uh, the children actually they think whether they will take a, a chocolate pie or banana. They think because oh I'm in school I'll so let let do better I'll choose the banana. But when they see they the friends uh, choose the choco oh it's fine then to, to choose the choco. Probably that's the so that's that's that the way probably that's the way it works in in uh, in among the students or. I don't know if if we control the parental effect, uh, probably we can we can get different story. But but I don't know. That's a question that uh, 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 Robert Margarita and Matthias can can answer. So and and finally, uh, let me bring to other uh, policy implication of the study. So 
the paper states that uh, the uh, the the information doesn't work uh, in itself. Prob probably that's the, 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 the in one sense. And so the the biggest solution is uh, Robert talks about the parental or probably people will talk about the behavior based programs. So uh, so in Indonesia there is another program that uh, they call program busy anak sekolah. This is more behavioral based that uh, the school. So in this program, the government in collaboration with other agencies, they provide a meal for, uh, for children in school. Meal is intended to be nutritious. Uh, they invited the, the mothers or parents to, uh, to provide the meal by which they can uh, educate not only the children, but also the parents to provide good meals. But for some problems, uh, it's difficult for the government to uh, scale up the programs. So I remember in one uh, in one district that we, we visited for our study. So we, we asked them the, the district the district had implemented the program for several years, but uh, in that time they said we will not continue for uh, the next year. We asked why. One of the problem is that well we are we are in the health sector, and. Uh, and the program is run at school. So the program is run, is uh, located within two different agencies, health and education. And it's quite complicated in this country to deal with, with in terms of budget, whether it's, uh, it's budget for education or it's budget for health. That's uh, from the perspective of the local government, it's, uh, it's complicated and it's difficult because if we do that, probably KPK we will catch up and et cetera. So there is a, a kind of institutional problem. So. Uh, for countries like Indonesia, then the question is: If it is true that the behavior-based pro uh, program is more appropriate, how, if uh, based on the experiences of other countries or from the literature, what do you think? How government like Indonesia should implement the program under the central system? In terms of the that's in terms of the implementation itself, which can uh, raise some problems. The second is how to ensure that the such a program, behavior-based program, really achieve the the target. We see, for example, in, in the United States, the country has a huge uh, program for providing meal for, for children. Uh, and it is run for, for years, right? But if I notice, uh, if, if, uh, as mentioned in my previous slide, in the US, uh, of obesity among the, the children, consumption of fruit and vegetable is among the lowest. So if the country runs behavioral programs, which target directly to the children, it doesn't really, it doesn't necessarily uh, address the, the problem. Then. So that's uh, that's uh, another question, right? So so uh, if if we look if we go back to the first year one, the uh, on the first question. So if the information itself might not work uh, in itself, or or in the worst scenario, it doesn't work, or and then. If the countries grow to the behavior, but it doesn't work either, it becomes more complicated. So probably uh, that's uh, uh, my question. So I think it's it's good to hear from Robert or uh, Margarita or Matias. How what do you think about this in the in context of Indonesia? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Master Rajudin. Great discussion, uh, Robert and co-authors. Would you like uh, to use this time, maybe three minutes, to um, respond to some of uh, Master Rajudin's uh, issues that he raised before we go to the bigger Q and A with the attendees? Yeah, great. Uh, well, thanks for the comments. Um, I think that was really. Uh, uh, really extensive, really thorough those comments. Uh, they're, they're really useful. Now, I, I will give my call if there's a, a chance to, to respond to this. I, I do want to point out a few things, uh, things you raised. You started indeed looking at some uh, some figures from other countries, and I think, I think that that was very useful, and I think it emphasized the point I made at the beginning, um, that this notion of a nutrition transition, this is really a global phenomenon, right? It's not an Indonesian phenomenon. Um, what the, how I assess it, but I don't know if people agree with me on this, is that Indonesia is still at the relatively early stage of a nutrition transition, even though it does rank poorly indeed on things like dietary diversity. Um, but th that this nutrition transition will <coughs> continue and that we will see rising of rising uh, or increasing incidence of, of, of overweight, 
I mean, I think that is inevitable if we look at other countries, right? There, this, we look at also other Southeast Asian countries, but also in other parts of the world. Um, this development is not going to stop, and uh, it's something we need to be aware of. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, what we see that also in other parts of the world. Um, and I would say that for Europe and the US, we are, we are well into the transition transition, and uh, the US, I guess, is, is still probably the worst example of uh, uh, case of obesity. Um, now, I, I, um, I'm not sure what I should do. Maybe I should let Margarita and Matthias respond. I also saw some comments in the Q&A, but I won't go into those yet. We can deal with those later. Um, uh, on the parents, um, I, I agree with that, that, that. Indeed, the parents are uh, probably the biggest influence or one of the biggest influences. We don't look at that in our study yet, right? We, because that's something we don't randomize. That, that, that is not a random effect, but we do have we, we do have some more data indeed. That is now part of additional research that we're working on. Um, we would like to do something with the parents though. So that's something for future uh, uh, work. Um, maybe I should let Margarita or Matthias respond because I'm, I'm, I'm talking a bit too much, I guess. <laughs> Um, um, or maybe we take the, some of the questions as well, so that Margarita and uh, Matthias oh, yeah, can maybe, maybe also yeah. respond uh, yeah. to the questions. We have seven questions, so I'll start from the top. Um, it's from Grace Wangge, uh, which said, which asked that, uh, which mentioned that the students were put in experimental setting, not a usual school canteen or snack breaks and based on your uh, photo i think it looks very official yeah if i were a six uh, a six year old and seven year old and coming to that place with the flag on the right you know i will be very pressured to choose the um the healthy choice but this is um the, the question by grace do you expect they will continue to make a better decision post study and why did you use banana instead of healthy local snacks for example, traditional cakes. Um, I might put my own spin on that. Um, banana is very common in Indonesian households, so maybe they've eaten banana every day, so they would like something else. So because um, uh, uh, this is a consideration. That's from Grace. Let's take another one from Rita Simorangkir. Rita is at ANUS from Singapore. Thank you for joining us, Rita. Um, she would like to ask about the choice of the unhealthy snack. Is choco pie something that these children have prior experience before, especially without the snack cover? And 63% of the control group students choosing banana seems a bit high. Um, and it seems that the effect comes from students' familiarity with banana rather than choco pie. So maybe let's take that couple of questions first. Silakan. Um. I have a response to this, but maybe Margarita, you want to give it a go, or Matthias? Yeah, I can. Uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting us. It's a great uh, honor to present the paper first time, uh, the, the great seminar series. Uh, uh, I just uh, to come back to Grace, uh, uh, the question about uh, banana versus uh, traditional healthy snacks. I wouldn't say that cakes are healthy, but. And we just talk, and Arif was talking a lot about food consum fruit consumption and uh, how low it is in, uh, in Indonesia. So we were trying to compare uh, fruits uh, versus uh, something which is processed, right? And then traditional cake, which we also tried. Uh, I forgot the name, it's a puffed cake that we also tested in one of our pilots. Um, so th this will be the, the processed food, which, is, uh, which would be seen for us as unhealthy. Yeah, so we tried it and we found a better, uh, as Robert said before, better combination of banana and choco pie. And related to the next question, uh, we tried Oreo and other cookies. <laughs> it was better 60-40 uh, preference. This would allow us to uh, get this variation, to, to measure this variation in the choices affected by the treatment conditions. Okay. Um, from yeah, Pido, Sorry, I, there was a, the question indeed, that 63% seems a bit high. Yes. And uh, indeed, mm -hmm. also your point is, is it seems a bit formal, of course, and it's in, in a school. And um, what I think is important to point out, and that's why I also emphasize that at the beginning, that um, um, th this is a behavioral experiment. We're not sort of, we're not testing in a policy, right? We're not trying to recreate um, the, the decision that children face in, re in real life. 
Uh, and also the results that we find are not sort of representative for real life, say real life choices. Um, so we don't know what those, that 63% means in real life. In the pilot, it was a bit lower, for example. I think in the pilot it was the reverse. Um, but the point is, how do the children react to the nudges? That, so that's what we look at. We, we won't interpret this 63% as a sort of a, a number that can influence policy. But what we look at is how do these behavioral nudges uh, relate to, for example, providing information. And that can then be input for uh, making policy decisions or maybe uh, testing a real policy in real life, right? So that's why it's important to emphasize this is a behavioral experiment and we should be careful to interpret those numbers as them as they are. Um, uh, if, and of course, I should also mention that, uh, that the choice itself uh, except for the supervisor, no one was there, right? So it's not that the parent, the teacher wasn't looking, and there was not, uh, there was just a supervisor uh, that's there. Um, but it's important to to not interpret this as a policy evaluation. This is really a study to try to understand what triggers a child's decision, um, and, um, and so we look more at the difference between the nudges that, or the, the treatments than the uh, the numbers themselves. Sorry, go ahead, Lydia. You, you wanted to. Put okay. Um, let's take a couple of questions. I I see that Rido Al Izati from Smeru is asking about uh, videos with the negative nudges, such as uh, YouTube videos and other social media promoting unhealthy food and eating behavior. Would the effect of these nudges, if it can compare to a certain extent to this study, can be caught? categorized as cognitive nudges or negative peer effect. Yeah, um, that's from Rido Al Izati. I see another question also relating to uh, by um, Desi Pane, who is watching on YouTube. Desi is at Papanas, I know. Uh, thank you for uh, coming. A uh, short uh, question is also related to um, information and she mentions about ads on snacks in the television every day. Um, but there is not much ads about healthy food. So her question is, how do you control this prerequisite information that children probably already have uh, uh, from television? And it may depend on how each child is exposed on that information. And then the second one is uh, your study shows that knowledge and influence matters in food choices. Do you think the study could suggest government to start advocating ads uh, on in television. So maybe those two from Rido Al Izati who uh, uh, ask whether um, not just like YouTube videos comparable to what you use on uh, in your study, and also from Desi Pane about the ads on in television. This sounds like a really good question for Matthias. Uh, <laughs> Matthias, you have a a response to this? So, uh, thank you uh, everyone for attending and uh, thank you for giving us these great questions and comments and a lot of food for thought. Um, on this last question, I do want to say that um, when you're in a lab setting and asked to make a food choice, of course you will bring into the lab all the experiences and the information that you've been exposed outside of the lab. And that will influence your choices within the lab. But within the lab, we just look at some experimental variations, some treatments. And so the prior information a priori is balanced across different groups, but it could still interact with your prior experiences. But we did not look at that specifically, so it's a very good point. On the question about food advertisements, um, this is one type of information that children are exposed to all the time, and they will bring it into the lab. So naturally, somehow, these experiences also shape their food choices. Um, the information treatment that we had seemed to improve food choices, but it's hard to say how this kind of treatment would now play out outside of the lab. I think. Um, because it will be something that you're continuously exposed to. So it would, would need uh, a kind of more extended study. But I do uh, see that if you compare the effect of the information treatment compared, for instance, to the negative peer effects that we see, 
the information effects are relatively small. So that's some good news and bad news because on one hand, uh, information works. On the other hand, if there are peers and their their effects are negative, and that this negative peer if, if behavior is shaped by the negative information they are exposed to, well, there's also negative information floating around that can be magnified by peers. Okay, so hold on on putting those ads on television for now, <laughs> if I can um, summarize from your uh, uh, answer. So from Ardiani Dewi, um, uh, she asked about the intervention for healthy nutrition consumption. Um, what are the composition level of effort to change the mind of behavior to parent, children, or peer? Any studies show what is the effective intervention to address behavioral change among parent and child or child, child and peer. So um, this is something that your study is going, is, is studying, I guess, to, to, to uh, identify the effective in intervention, but maybe um, there is something that is in the literature or experience that is um, confirmed as effective. Um, uh, this is something asked by Artiani Dewi. And Trimulyaning Si, which I think is joining us from Solo, Central Java. Is there any difference in the setting of the study, if not at school? If yes, can you suggest how to mitigate this bias um, of having the, the experiment be done in school, I guess, compared to uh, somewhere else? So that's two questions. Um, I see a few raised hands, so maybe uh, we give one um, chance to ask the question, Pak Shueb, would you like to ask your question live, Pak Shueb, but please um, be brief so that we have time for other other questions. Pak Shueb, are you going to ask your question? Okay, so um, maybe we move on to that. Those, those are two from Ardiani Dewi and Trimulyaning Si. And there's one on YouTube from Akira Wisnu. Um, will controlling poverty status or household income where the children uh, belong to affect the children's decision of food? So uh, maybe this is something that you already have in your study but not presented. So maybe those three questions. Uh, from uh, the uh, the Q and A box. Um, maybe let, let's go. I can answer some of the last later questions about the um, um, example about the poverty and income state. So the the um, so there's I guess two things to to look at. One is um, the role of income and 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 socioeconomic status or, or income or, or income of the household. Or poverty, um, because we've randomized the treatments, they themselves should not be biasing any results. Uh, right? So um, they do not play a role in the, for our sample, they don't play a role uh, or they don't influence our results. So we, we, we showed also in the paper that we have a very nicely balanced sample. The question is, of course, and I, I, I think uh, that was also just raised in the discussion, um, is to what extent is Jakarta representative for um, the, the, the larger population of children? Um, and um, I, I think I'm not, I'm, I think what Arif was saying is that there is, um, I think you're saying that the, result, that the nutrition patterns in, in, in rural or urban Jakarta compared to rural areas isn't that different, right? Uh, but yeah, it might not, still not be. That. Yeah, so so it might still be so so uh, in that sense um, maybe also income. Uh, essentially, it's about the context of the study. So so would we expect very similar results, for example, if we do this in a rural Kalimantan, all right? If we do the same experiment there in a village, will we get the same results? Well, we don't know, right? We we might want to more want to do that. Um, um, what? What we, although maybe dietary patterns might be different in Jakarta, and not be very different in Jakarta, maybe the exposure to certain types of food is. Uh, maybe the, the advertisement, or although you see that, of course, also in rural areas, uh, there's large advertisement, but maybe the exposure to certain media 
exposure to, to certain information, it might be different. So it might be interesting to do this in other contexts as well. Uh, and I think uh, that that's a fair point. Um, but I would say only for the context of the study, not so much for the results, because that, of course, we, we randomized those out. Um, and um, I guess the same refers to the question about um, um, whether you know should we do this in a school? Uh, do we get will we get very different results if we do this in a in in a I don't know what other setting we could do this, but if you bring children to a, a community center or so, uh, I don't know um, because I a school is a very fairly safe environment for for children. So I would exp in that sense I would think a school is a nice place to to do this. Right, children feel comfortable, to feel safe. You have to. The, the, the environment of the, the teachers are nearby, the classmates. So in that sense, uh, um, um, I wouldn't think, but maybe that's my perception. It, it is, I wouldn't actually perceive it as a very formal setting. I would actually see it's a rather, rather informal setting. Uh, and my experience is that children, uh, they were having a lot of fun outside the, the experimental room. So they were not feeling they were in a, in a, in a formal setting. In, in a formal setting, they were having a lot of fun in the, uh, the snack room. Um, um, I don't know what, what Matthias and, and Margarita feel about this. Um, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I should like, give the word to, maybe do you have something to say about Margarita? Yeah, that uh, I think indeed the school is quite a safe environment and children more than the way among their friends, those classmates that they see every day. So and if we want to uh, measure how these classmates may influence their choices, I think it's the best environment to test. If you want to set similar experiments, uh, I think my biggest learning was you have to control for everything. You don't want children to see other children eating uh, bananas or choco pies, or you don't want other classes know that they are going to go through that. So it should take them at the surprise. So when Robert was talking about the briefing for children at class, we didn't tell them, look, we will give you a choice because it will again uh, already prompt them to, oh, I have to make a decision. So I have to do, make a right decision. What do they expect from me, which will bias, of course, our results. So we would tell them, okay, you guys, you can, you will answer some questions about which food you like, why you like them. And meanwhile, you can pick a snack. So there are two options, take one. So that's what we did. So we, to some extent, it could be seen, seen as a, a bit of a deception, but we were open, but we didn't tell them what we expect from them because that's what really drive our results. Okay, great. Um, should we move to the uh, next question? I have uh, someone who also would like to post the question to um, us, uh, Zero Judin as well, um, by Gusti Nur Asla Shabia. Um, for Robert and colleagues, is there any finding from the children who show media influence, not only advertisement, but social media? Um, to their food selection behavior. So I think what um, maybe if I can interpret is um, how much this, uh, did you find out about how much the children have access to social media, for example, um, as a background of, of uh, in their daily life, yeah. Um, and then for Robert uh, and Masiro Judin, um, how do you see the industrial or ultra processed food agents role? I'm not sure about this, but um, uh, Ibu atau Bapak Gusti, would you like to post the question directly? If yes, uh, then you can raise your hand. But maybe uh, the uh, industrial or processed food agent, meaning uh, in how they influence children in uh, making their food choices. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then uh, from Bashu F, who previously raised the hand, um, children under five, something and overweight, uh, overweight how, how much of them who had malnutrition? And the important things are nutrition education for the young parents. So I guess if you are stunted, then by definition, you have malnutrition. I, I don't know if I'm correct. Maybe if uh, pa, uh, Mashiro uh, uh, Chirojin would like to answer or give clarification to Pa Shuk about uh, malnutrition amongst children under five years old. So maybe those two questions first or comments, I guess, from Gusti Nur Asla. 
and from Shuet Abu Harifa. Is that to me or to Robert first? Um, if you would like to take it first, Masih Rojudin. Okay, just uh, so brief, brief answer. Uh, thank you, Bulidia. So first about malnutrition. <laughs> As a background information, actually, we, we have right now, Indonesia has not only double malnutrition, but actually we have triple malnutrition, triple burden of malnutrition. One bully is right, that if you, if you are stunted, if a children is stunted or overweight, they have malnutrition, that's right. So other than uh, uh, undernutrition, which consists of uh, stunting and underweight, we have uh, the second issue is overweight, and the, the, the next uh, overweight, uh, nutrition transition usually resolves to overweight problems. So that's the double burden of nutrition. The second, the third one is we have micronutrient deficiencies. So Indonesia has, has a problem in, in that side too. So once again, not only double, but triple burden of nutrition. So to the question uh, about the uh, industrial and ultra processed food. So the way I see is that, uh, the way uh, 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 the, the the influence of this the industry, I think, is mediated by uh, availability, uh, and the second one is about the the advertisement through television, right? So they uh, they uh, uh, advent they have advantages uh, because they can uh, create uh, food at uh, massive and then uh, uh, cheap, right? So probably healthy food cannot compete with them uh, uh, easily. But the problem is that uh, in terms of availability, Indonesia has a problem, especially if, if, you, if you look at non-rice. So from the last few years, the government focused only on, on staple at the, ex, at the expense of other uh, types of uh, food, especially if it's staple and fruit. So that's uh, in terms of availability, probably in the way uh, the country can compete. We can compete is improve, improve the availability of uh, of this health kind of healthy food, right? And uh, this is a surprising uh, information from the risk studies. So yes, Jakarta reflects the the general and uh, the, the the mean of the country, but the country has certain variation, and it is surprising that actually people in the Papua actually they had good diversity. So actually, more people in Papua than in Jakarta consume sufficient uh, enough fruit and vegetables. So that's uh, that's tells something, right? So probably they have more availability. It's closer to them, and, uh, and other thing I, I don't know exactly. But the point is, uh, uh, the government can uh, say compete with the industry in terms of helping how uh, fresh and healthy food uh, available more easily accessible for the, for for people. We can see that if you go, if you go to, for example, in uh, I don't know whether it's policies, but if you go to Indomart or Alfamart, probably it's more difficult to get a uh, healthy, uh, uh, say, vegetable and fruit other than, rather than uh, processed food, for example. But that probably that's for some reason, probably. But if that for some reason, certainly there's something to do. And then Indonesia also have a problem with the, uh, uh, say, uh, I think. Uh, in terms of waste, for, for example, but probably it, it's about consumption, but waste is also a problem. How uh, So again, the problem is not only how to do education, but probably in terms of the systemic level, there is something to address how to deal with the, the influence of the industry, especially in terms of availability. Thank you, Bulidia. Okay, yeah. Um, Robert, would you like to comment on this about children's exposure to social media? and advertisement um and how does they, that affect their food selection behavior um so did you collect for example information on their exposure to social media and uh, uh and cross uh, tabulate that with their decision in the uh, healthy banana or choco pie i don't that's know from we have Nur Asla Shabia. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't think we have information on that, uh, but I have to look at Margarita. We don't know whether they're, they're quite young, right? That's first of all, so I, they're all, um, so I don't know to what extent they are exposed to social media, but we, um, I don't think we have questions on that. Do we, Margarita? No, we only collected information from their parents on the screen time. So how many hours per day child yeah. uh, stays uh, in front of TV or uh, uh, any other gadget, gadget. 
So we know that approximately the on average uh, the, our children in our samples spend five hours. So we don't know exactly what they do there, but we could expect that they also use uh, watch some YouTube videos. And there was previous question about how influencers and they are influencers. They will influence their choice for unhealthy probably food. And knowing the results of study, maybe the effect of um, um, influence on the healthy food will not be that great. But we can see them, yes, as a as a as a peer also. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rita Siborankir has a follow up question, um, asking whether students know or have tasted both options, or perhaps in the post survey. Uh, to ask why didn't you choose the other option? Uh, uh, Rita is concerned that this is not a choice between healthy and healthy snack, but more on familiarity versus unfamiliarity with the snacks. Um, so that's from Rita. Uh, let's take another one. Um, from Anhar Danaputra, I think somewhat related. This is a powerful insight for policy makers. But how do you transform this be into a feasible and doable policy? Should government or school ban students to buy unhealthy snacks? Or uh, uh, could only show their peers that they only choose healthy food? So banning the students from buying unhealthy snacks. Um, of course, this is the paternalistic uh, uh, policy option that he, Robert had mentioned. Another interesting question is from Samantha regarding uh, pocket money. Uh, maybe pocket money and snacks are gi uh, uh, given from the parents from home affect the choice decision from the children. So I guess in this study, not, but maybe in your background, information collected from uh, this, the children. Sometimes if adult children are given the accessibility to healthy snacks or fruit, they may still want to hang out with their peers by buying food in the canteen or from the street vendors, as long as they have the pocket money. So those three uh, questions. And I think we're running out of time. We have one more. Maybe I should just ask. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's that should be okay. Yeah. Okay, let me try to answer yeah. some of these questions, and I, but yeah. I, I maybe Matthias and uh, uh, Margarita might have an opinion on this as well. Um, now I, there are some really good questions here, right? I think the question on uh, the pocket money and, and the food, of, which is essential, also the food environment of the school, and that's really important. And there was a question. So I'm just scrolling again to reread them um, about the libertarian pater, uh, paternalism. Uh, also an excellent question, right? So. so um, again, what's important to emphasize is we're not, this is not a policy evaluation. We're trying to look at some of the factors that change, that affect children's decisions. Um, in our results, our results don't say that information doesn't work, right? It says it does work, right? So information does have a role. Our results only also don't say that you cannot have sort of uh, policies that can influence individual Decisions. So, to, 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 you, they, they, we still find some effect, for example, of those, those emojis um, that really shape the, the individual's decision um, uh, or, or you know, that, that, that appeal to the individual's um, responsibilities. Maybe a big word, but their, um, uh, right, their own individual decision making space um, and using the knowledge they have to, to, to select a snack. But what we do show is that within the social context, um, those effects are limited. So there's a limitation in what you can do with such policies. Um, in other words, we, we can create, right? we can set up policies to, to influence individuals' decisions, but if we still then apply those policies in a context where there is a lot of availability of unhealthy food, and think again indeed about these street vendors outside the schools and we give them pocket money, um, those, that information that we give the children and the, the, the nudges or, or the little incentives that we provide, um, they might be outweighed by the food environment or the behavior of the peers. And that's the point that we want to make is we are not saying mm -hmm. this doesn't work or that doesn't work, but you really need to see this in the, in the wider context. And that's why I think that comment about the pocket money and the food environment is really important because we saw it, of mm -hmm. course, also at our experiment. We're doing the experiment on floor one of the school 
and, I'm lo- and we look down on the on the school courtyard, and there is children buying essentially deep fried sugar from the street vendor. Vendor, right? So, um, so that, I guess that's the message of our our study is that, yeah, you can consider those those uh, those, those those policies, even media uh, uh, interventions or interventions in schools, but you really if you don't do something about the food environment, if you don't consider the more paternalistic options as well, then um, those individual targeted interventions might not be very effective. But uh, it is, again, important to emphasize that this is information to go into policy. So what you ideally would like to do now is maybe scale up uh, an actual intervention at schools or, or with school or with government programs and try variations in those interventions on how can we make the most effective? Can we combine these government programs, school programs with affecting the, the, the food environment around schools, um, etc. cetera? Um, I don't know, Matthias uh, or uh, Margarita, if you have anything to add to this? Uh, maybe this one on the uh, choice between healthy or unhealthy, but rather familiarity versus unfamiliarity. Um, I'll give that one to Margarita. I think uh, okay. she has uh, looked in the, into this extensively. Yes, indeed. We, uh, we were concerned that choco pie maybe is not that widely present, so we did some background search. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, look, so this. Uh, I would then, I would, if, if it's not that familiar to children, but it looks uh, so attractive, being chocolatey and really sugary, so probably more children will pick it up uh, rather than banana that somebody said that they would eat it every day because it's so popular. So we didn't see that. Uh, so we, we thought that, okay, so that was a proportion of those who would pick banana and choco pie, and would say if in the in pilot it would be 50, 50, or 40, 40, 60, that would give us uh, the chance to uh, explore the effect of our nudges, as I said before. So it's not really about familiarity, but yes, indeed, it's probably not that popular, but it was, uh, again, making us again more attractive for them also to pick. Okay. Yep. Does it, does um, it answer the question? Yeah, I think I think it answers the question. Um, Choco pie is one of my favorite snacks. <laughs> I have to admit here, um, but it is kind of on the expensive side for school children. So at, uh, maybe that's an insight from me, uh, especially the, um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, may, maybe from the cost side. Um, another question here, do we have time? Maybe very short, and I think it uh, is uh, last words from the researchers and also Masiro Judin. Uh, from Hapsari Kusumanindia, so say, would it be more effective if the, if the intervention about healthy eating choices um, comes from the parents? Yeah, so not only from the school uh, setting. So, and I think that uh, gives the landscape for giving the last uh, words about uh, uh, the, the topic. Uh, maybe Masiro Jutin, if you would like to comment first. Well, I think it's time for Robert and uh, Margarita and Matthias to say that. So I just uh, once again congratulations for this super interesting paper and very powerful uh, message to the policymakers. So hopefully uh, we can do better for our children. Thank, thank you once again. Thank you, uh, Robert, Matthias, and Margarita. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure how to answer. I, I guess mm-hmm. I interpret the last question more as a comment because I, I would say I agree. Um, this is something that it's something we can't say much about now with our study, but it's certainly something mm-hmm. that you, of course, want, want to investigate further. And of course, the home environment and parents' uh, uh, behavior is very important. And it is something that we look into. We will look into, but I don't think I could say anything sensible beyond that. Um, I don't know if Matthias or Margarita have anything to add to that. Okay, so if uh, no additions from Matthias and Margarita, maybe I'll just close the session um, with uh, uh, thanks to all the speakers. It's certainly been a 
very uh, rigorous, one of the more rigorous uh, uh, FKP session that we have at uh, this this year. And thank you for your time, Masiro Judin, to provide discussion. Uh, and for everyone else, thank you for attending the FKP this well today uh, uh, at noon. And you will find the slides and video recording on our website, so you can refer back later. And hopefully this is also uh, an inspiration for others who would like to do experimental economics, behavioral economics, because this is relatively uh, uh, new and very rare to be done in Indonesia. Um, thank you again, and uh, I hope to see everyone at the next FKP. Uh, so, uh, good morning to everyone in Europe. Have uh, Enjoy your breakfast, I guess, and enjoy your uh, lunch, everyone in Jakarta and WIB. And uh, I know some people joining from Canberra, uh, enjoy your afternoon uh, or evening dinner. Um, so, I'm going to close now, but I will put up uh, the slide of our next event but in the meanwhile if you would like to log out uh, feel free um, uh, i close the, the the session thank you everyone thank you lydia thank you very thank much you. for